The psychedelic revolution is here. If you want to integrate your visionary experiences into your purpose, get clear on your entrepreneurial path and help people while you do what you love, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to The Psychedelic Entrepreneur, medicine for these times. I'm your host, Beth Weinstein. I'm a spiritual business coach, three-time entrepreneur, and a lifelong student of psychedelics and sacred plant medicines. You carry your own unique medicine, and your medicine is what we need for these times. This podcast will help you to share your medicine so you can create transformation in the world. Listen in on conversations with psychedelic leaders, change makers, and conscious entrepreneurs who are living proof that a better world is possible when you follow your heart and live in alignment with your soul. I'm so excited to have Ronan Levy from Field Trip Health talking to us today here, taking time out of his busy schedule. Thank you so much for being with us, Ronan. My pleasure. I'm glad we finally aligned. I felt like we had like seven different recording dates and I kept <laughs> canceling and then, yeah, so sorry about that, but it's nice to be here. <laughs> All good. Nice to meet you. And um, actually, I just recalled that we were on a panel together back in 2020. Yeah, that's, I'm like, we Long have kind of indirectly met um, talking about yeah. psychedelic business back at the, you know, the beginning of this huge growth. And it's so funny. It was only two years ago, but it seems like eons, right? In this, in this space that we're in. <laughs> It, it genuinely feels like lifetimes ago, and that's just not a commentary on the psychedelic space, which it, it has been lifetimes, but also the pandemic. I mean, the last two years kind of just evaporated. And like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That did happen. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. There was, I was alive for the last two years. I've just mostly blocked it out. <laughs> I keep saying it's like one gigantic psychedelic trip, life. Who needs psychedelics? But uh, we'll, we'll get into it. But I want to tell people a little bit about you, your bio. Um, so believing that you should never hesitate to trade your cow for a handful of magic beans, Ronan has built a career out of doing things that others say cannot be done. Ronan started his career as a securities lawyer at Blake Castles and Graydon LLP, but left after left that after realizing he was much too creative for the profession of law. Since then, Ronan has helped launch businesses across a number of industries from gold to cannabis and most recently in psychedelics where he is a co-founder and the executive chairman of Field Trip Health Limited. This is a NASDAQ traded stock that, disclosure, I have a little bit of stock in, but not enough to make it really matter. <laughs> so um, Field Trip is a global leader in the development and delivery of psychedelic therapies. When not being thoroughly incorrigible, Ronan lives in Toronto with his wife and two children. And you can check him out on Twitter, Ronan D. Levy, and FieldTripHealth.com. And you can also download their app, which I downloaded myself to just check out, and it's beautifully designed. Um so Ronan, it's so good to have you. You know, it's it's funny on this podcast when I ask people the first question about what's their career path and their story, I, I actually make jokes about, were you once a corporate attorney? Um, and now I actually have someone who who pretty much almost was, right? Or a different kind of attorney. But I'd love to hear your your career path. What brought you to where you are now running, um, you know, a psychedelic company and, and starting in, let's say, law? What was your your path? Sure. So my uh, convergence on psychedelics was actually a convergence of two kind of separate themes in my life. Um, one was I, I did start my uh, career as a practicing corporate lawyer or corporate attorney, uh, which is U.S. speak in Canada, oh, which is call ourselves okay. lawyers. Um, and genuinely despised it and realized it was a terrible profession uh, that anyone who, uh, I, I actually I took a course in stand-up comedy once. I'm not very good at it, but uh, I remember I had one joke, which is like any self-respecting lawyer, I had no respect for myself. Um, and, and it really kind of felt that way in the practice of law. Like it really is not a profession for many people. Uh, and it certainly wasn't for me. It's long hours, it's grinding work, it's lots of paper generally uninspiring. It pays pretty well. Um, but when it comes down to the minutes and hours you actually get to be on this planet, spending so much time doing that was not something I wanted to pursue long-term. So 
I slowly but surely, I wish I had the gall to just quit my job and become an entrepreneur. My friend Beth Hirschfeld actually did. She was a first year associate at at Blake's with me. And one day she's like, I'm done. And she quit and she had no plans for what she was going to do next. I didn't have that kind of courage. And so I took a little bit more incremental approach to leaving. I went in-house with a a pharmaceutical company called BioVail. I then went in-house with CTV. Uh, which is a Canadian broadcaster that owned MTV in Canada uh, and Much Music, which was the Canadian equivalent of MTV. And that was a really cool experience because I got to live out my childhood dream of hanging out with rock stars, which I did do, uh, although the work I did there was really quite menial. Uh, It was kind of fun for a while. Uh, And it kind of got me interested in digital, digital things. Like we, we, um, broadcast a live a, a live concert of the band fallout boy uh through mobile and this was back when everybody only had flip phones so imagine trying to watch a concert live through a flip phone uh it was pretty terrible production but it's kind of cool work to be doing um and so with the basis of that knowledge of of digital law and technology and what was happening i actually got a job at an in-house uh, as general counsel at an online dating company um And that online dating company was pretty cheeky in a lot of the things it did. And it really taught me a lot of lessons about where lawyers think the world is and where truthfully most people think the world is and where that world actually is. And they're actually quite divergent. And and I realized that there's a great opportunity if, if you're willing to see that gray zone between perception and reality, very psychedelic insight, I suppose, in some levels, you know, there's a lot of opportunity as an entrepreneur. Um, And so uh, I didn't last at that company too long. Uh, there are a lot of issues. And, and so I quit finally, uh, like Beth and became an entrepreneur. Uh, and a first opportunity I had was to start a cash for gold company. It was a random chance, but taking that lens of insight of if you're willing to wade where other people aren't willing to go, there's a lot of opportunity. I was like, well, most people don't want to be in the cash for gold industry. Therefore there should be opportunity there. And, and so went there didn't have ambitions of doing that for a lifelong uh, career. So I started doing some freelance legal work, you know, with startups in Toronto and happened to meet the people who would become my co-founders in our last business, uh, which is a company called Canadian Cannabis Clinics, uh, who were evaluating a whole bunch of ideas, including this one in the cannabis space. Uh, and I was like, why aren't you doing something? If cannabis is going legal, why aren't you doing this? Because how often do you get that opportunity where you already have product market fit? You just have to insert yourself into the conversation. Um, and they're like, oh, well, cannabis, marijuana, it seems so greasy and shady. We don't want to be a part of that. And I was like, well, it just so happens that I'm very comfortable wading into these kinds of areas. Um, and after cajoling them for a while, we joined forces. We opened Canadian Cannabis Clinics, uh, which became the largest network of cannabis specialized medical clinics in Canada. We sold that to Aurora Cannabis in 2016, spent a couple of years with Aurora, left. And the first conversation we had after we left was about what was happening in the emerging psychedelic space. Um, And when we had that conversation, it really spoke to me for a number of reasons. One is I'm inherently contrarian and doing something as outlandish as psychedelics really appealed to me. But B, throughout, you know, most of my late 20s and early 30s, I'd been doing a lot of work with coaching and therapy and meditation and spirituality. And so it kind of hit two sweet spots for me, which is like this interest in, in personal growth and, and doing shit people say you can't do. So it, it was the perfect alignment. And, and that's how we found ourselves starting Field Trip in, back in 2019. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, what a story. I didn't know uh, the gold part and the, the actually I didn't know about the attorney part or the lawyer part. So We're glad you're doing psychedelics and not corporate law. Um, But I'd love to know, uh, you know, what was your first experience with psychedelics and how did how did any experiences with psychedelics affect your career path or did it, you know, at all? I'm curious. I mean, it really depends on how you define a psychedelic experience. If we're talking about psychedelic compounds, um, I had only ever tried psilocybin twice in my life up to the point of that fateful conversation in 2018. Um, the first time I was extremely drunk, it was, uh, it was new year's Eve. And so I had no idea what effect the psilocybin had on me, if any. Uh, in fact, that pretty much describes my second experience with it as well. There's a really kind of 
<laughs> interesting, a little bit graphic story I could tell uh, about my second experience, but I'll, I'll save your listeners from that unless you're, you're so inclined uh, to hear that story. Um, so my first real experience was after that conversation in 2018, where we were alerted to what was happening with psychedelics, you know, we were like, well, if we're going to potentially go down this path from an entrepreneurial and career perspective, we should know what we're talking about at least a little bit. So uh, a friend of mine who happened to grow psilocybin mushrooms hooked us up with three grams. There are three of us, so one gram each. And and we sat on the couches in our office and took them to see what happened. And it was, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like a complete revelation to me in terms of like, Oh my God. But I was like, Oh, I can see, I can see the potential here. I can see how these can be incredibly powerful. The one really, uh, pivotal thing that came out for me was we were in a little bit of a dispute with Aurora, the company that acquired our business and that we had just left. And we had felt, and, and it's till this day, I still believe that we had acted maturely, thoughtfully, and honestly in the circumstances. And so I was not fully understanding why they were upset with us. But during this one gram psilocybin experience, I had a deep level of empathy saying like, oh, oh, I get it. It's like, I still think what we did was absolutely right, but I can still understand why they're annoyed with us, notwithstanding we took a mature path. And, and that really gave me the insight of why these things can be so powerful. Because if you can de develop that level of embodied empathy um, with other people, that can change the world. There's, there's no doubt about that. And, and so, you know, things took off from there. Mm. I'm assuming you've you've uh, had a ketamine experience since then as well, right? Yeah, I've, I've, been making up, <laughs> I've been making up for last time. Um, so yes, I had a ketamine experience. Um, I've had a couple of, well, I, after that, we had a couple of psilocybin experiences. Uh, the first time I was really able to travel after the pandemic started, uh, I was in Santa Monica and I had a ketamine experience at our, our field trip health location. Um and actually, more more recently, in parallel to my work with Field Trip, we've been uh, producing a documentary called Ordinary Trip, where I really subject myself to all sorts of experiences. So uh, went to Costa Rica and did a psilocybin ceremony and a San Pedro ceremony, went to Field Trip Netherlands and did a psilocybin clinical experience, and then also uh, experienced 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, the documentary is going to be called Ordinary Trip, um, which is really about just trying to mainstream the conversation that you don't one of the challenges I think in the psychedelic space is that for most people on the outside looking in, there's kind of four groups who are interested in psychedelics. People, you know, military veterans who have experienced probably the worst horrors that just about anybody can experience who, you know, are, are broken by having been in theater. Um, people with extreme depression or anxiety. Um, Silicon Valley bro type. It's like, you know, Joe Rogan and then hippies. And so, that doesn't really speak to the vast majority of people around the world or certainly in Canada or the U S and, and so the hope with a documentary is like, how do we, how do we start to bring people into the middle of that conversation being like, you can be a very healthy, normal, whatever that means, well-established functional human being and still see a lot of benefits from, from psychedelics. Um, and, and so that's the hope with a documentary. Yeah, I agree because, you know, again, that's kind of what, what inspired me many years ago to start talking about this interconnection between the psychedelic path and coming into, you know, a career or a business that aligns with your heart a lot more, you know, like being of service or having a purpose. Because I personally believe there's a lot of people in these careers, like you and I both, I was in corporate America for 15 years and hated it. You know, I did it because it was the safe way and I was raised to believe this was the only way. And there's more and more people where there, there is kind of this waking up to, especially since COVID, like, what is life all about? What am I doing? You know, there's been a lot of changes and changes in, um, you know, how we work and how we live. So I do believe there is much needed conversation for the, you know, the normal, whatever that means, functioning person and um, psychedelics, how, how they can help us in bigger, better ways. Um, but let's talk about field trip. So uh, in case people out there haven't heard of field trip, what is the, the mission of your company? Like, what is all it all about? I mean, I know there's in-person ketamine clinics. I think you do online. Do you do the mail order or whatever they call the at-home ketamine as well? Or Yeah, we, we just yeah. launched that in 
partnership with a company yeah. called New Light. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And then there's an yeah. app. And so, yeah, tell us a little bit about Field Trip. Yeah. So, when we started Field Trip, the, the mission has kind of evolved and it's evolving again right now as we go through the corporate spin out. And I can give more details of that. But um, uh, when we started Field Trip, our, our mission was to heal the sick and better the well through psychedelic therapies. You know, pretty straightforward, kind of direct ripoff to some degree of one of the things that Michael Pollan said in, in How to Change Your Mind. Um, and it's evolved, I think, since then, but really. Our, our goal is to help mainstream, you know, the conversation and access, make this something that's accessible to all people. And, and in, in many ways, if you look at what's happening in Oregon and, and how Measure 109 was constructed, that's pretty consistent with our viewpoint that this is something that, you know, just about everybody should have access to, you know, our, our medical director in, in um, our Santa Monica location, Dr. Randy Sherlock, believes that even though the regulatory environment is environment isn't quite there, even from a medical perspective, is that psychedelics should be for, for anybody who has NHC. And I was like, what's NHC? And he said, normal human condition. Um, and, uh, and, and that's really kind of, I think the big picture purpose of what we're trying to achieve say like, this is, this is not something that should be taken frivolous, frivolously or recklessly or anything along those lines, but can be a very constructive practice, you know, um, within people's lives. And, and so we started with a very kind of narrow viewpoint of ketamine assisted therapy clinics, showing the data, showing the safety, transforming people's lives and, and building momentum in that way. But, and so that's the field trip health centers. We saw that after Denver and Oakland decriminalized psychedelics, that there's going to be a massive wave of people who are going to be exploring this without any guidance, without any support. Uh, and so we are like, okay, well, we can take these amazing protocols we've developed for our clinics and really make them available to people who are doing this on their own, you know, legal, not legal from a harm reduction perspective, we can help you make sure you have a good experiences and that helps everybody and it helps build our brand and create awareness for it. And that's why our app was born. Uh, and then we saw an opportunity to um, advance the science. You know, uh, the psychedelic molecules we have are fantastic, but it doesn't mean we can't do better, particularly from a medical perspective. So we developed, started our drug development division uh, with FT104, which is a pro drug of 4-HODIPT. Uh, and, and we're just imminently about to start our phase one trials. The first dosing is happening in the next week or so, uh, which is super exciting. And then, you know, we recently had launched the at home offering, which was, we realized that our brand and our message reached a lot of people. Um, but with only 12 locations, there was a big disconnect between who we were speaking to and who we could serve. And so we wanted to find ways to enhance and expand the, the people we could serve. And that's why we launched the at home offering. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. So I have a question about, you know, the, the kind of people that are working with field trip or turning to ketamine, um, you know, as someone who's I've personally to this day only worked with ketamine recreationally, you know, like Burning Man and parties and back in the old days, um, when it was called K and we would go into K holes, um, <laughs> no shame there back in the early nineties, but, you know, now everybody hears these miracle stories about veterans and PTSD and anxiety and depression. Um, and I know that's, you know, I've, I've heard from many people and some of my clients actually work for, you know, some of these ketamine clinics. Um, but who is, who is turning to ketamine and is this, is this going to be kind of the new Prozac? Like, or is this something where it's like you only need a certain amount of sessions and then life has changed? Or is this going to become something now, we, you know, I have low grade depression and now I need to do it every six months. I mean, what is it? What do you think that the future of these ketamine clinics looks like when it comes to actually helping people versus, you know, versus the old model of like, take a pill for the rest of your life? Yeah. Uh, and I'll just clarify. I mean, we offer ketamine in our North American locations. We offer psilocybin assisted therapy in our Netherlands location. And so we're platform, we're, we're molecule agnostic. It's just that ketamine is what's accessible yeah, right true. now from a <laughs> perspective. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, this is what's I think most exciting for me about what's happening with the psychedelic space, which is 
I don't want to in any way come across as anti-science or anti-medicine. It's like we've done amazing things with medicine to this point. The Western allopathic approach, the FDA approach has been fantastic. It's like we're not living any longer, which is interesting, but on average, most people are living longer. Like, you know, the lifespan's not changed very much since um, for the last 50 or 60 years, but a lot more people are living to 70, 80, 90 years old, which is a huge testament to, to modern Western medicine. But in the same token, and, and, and Jamie Wheel in his book, Recapture the Rapture, if you haven't read it, it's, it's a fantastic book, really kind of hits on that. Our, our neoliberal lifestyle, uh, the, the focus on consumerism combined with our focus on, on allopathic reactive medicine has resulted in people lacking meaning and while living longer, not necessarily living healthier, right? And, um, and so I think what's really exciting about psychedelics is that we can kind of shift both which is these experiences are very meaningful as as you touched upon they can open people's eyes or or help them wake up to seeing what really drives them and what makes them passionate and and what makes them feel good and and maybe that's a new career maybe that's just meditating maybe that's exercising more maybe that's starting or ending a relationship it's like these are really powerful things that really have nothing to do with medicine um but are a direct response to the medicine experience um and they help inform um you know our mental health and our emotional health and well-being so they're intricately related and and so to, to answer your specific question, is this the new Prozac? I don't think so. I think, you know, you touched on it. I don't know if it got recorded, but uh, life is a big psychedelic experience. And, and it is. And, and actually, we did um, an open house uh, at our Santa Monica location a couple months ago. And the, the themes were um, intent, insight, and integration you know, basically the arc of a psychedelic journey. And, and as I was preparing to talk during that, that open house, I realized that those three things are lifelong journeys, you know, setting the intent for what you want in anything you do. When you get out of bed being like, I'm going to go take a shower or go to work or go for a run. It's like, that's always a, an operating theme. Now, what is your intent for the day? The insights, we get insights all the time, whether it comes from a psychedelic experience or a dream or a conversation or watching a movie, we're constantly being getting insights, you know, in, in a very psychedelic way, even though it doesn't involve a psychedelic compound and then integration. It's like, what are the lessons? What are you going to do with the lessons that you took away from that? That has nothing to do with psychedelics specifically. That has everything to do with life. It's just hyper, hyper important in the, in the psychedelic context. And so from my perspective, ketamine, when psilocybin and MDMA and all of these other therapies become legal accessible, should become ideally part of your lifestyle, just like going to the gym. Uh, you know, we all accept that exercising and working out is good for us. We don't all do it, but we all accept that's really good for us. Why don't we take that same approach to our mental, emotional, and spiritual health and well being? And I think psychedelics are going to be the platform that enables people to start doing that or at least catalyzes a lot more people to start doing that. So I think it's, it's very different than conventional approaches. And yeah, I think people should come back. Does not mean daily or weekly? Absolutely not. Does not mean occasionally or as needed? Absolutely. Mm, no, that's very well said. And I, you know what, I really like that you mentioned things like meditation, you know, spiritual practice, um, integration, because there's a reality to, okay, the, the medicines only do so much. And we all know that. I mean, maybe that's not good for your business model, but there is a reality to it, right? It's like the medicines work to a point, but it's all this other, you know, the intention, the, the integration. And what I always say is like the daily practice. Um, I'm curious, you know, when people go to, let's say, a field trip for, let's say, what we would call normal depression, not like intense treatment resistant depression, but like the normal, you know, majority of our society seems to have anxiety, depression, or some form of, uh, you know, just general life PTSD. Um, you know, do you guys provide something that helps them actually get to the root cause of what is causing the depression in the first place? Like whether it's, you know, working with a coach or therapist that is not just administering the the ketamine or the psilocybin, but someone who's helping them process through the actual root of the problem causing the depression. You know, is that built into the field trip model or is that like, oh, there's a ton of coaches out there, go find one? 
Yeah. I, I mean, I think we offer more integration work than anybody out there. And I still think it's wholly inadequate because integration is a lifelong process. Like I, I, I just talked about. Um, so we, our, our process and what differentiates us from 99.9% .9 of the other ketamine clinics out there is that we offer ketamine assisted psychotherapy. You sit down with a therapist before, you know, we do the screening, you sit down with their therapist beforehand, you set your intentions. Therapist uh, is, is, checking in on you during the actual ketamine experience. And then after, typically after every two ketamine sessions, there's a non-drug integration session. And so that's a typical mo module, two ketamine sessions and one integration session. And most people complete two to three of those. And on the back of that, the results we're generating, as far as I'm aware, make the field trip protocol the single most effective depression and anxiety treatment out there are none. You know, we see people's uh, depression and anxiety scores on average go from severe to mild. Same with uh, and anxiety scores, depression and anxiety scores. I don't know if I said that. I apologize. Uh, it goes from severe to mild and those benefits last for 120 days on average. So you're talking about three to four months of uninterrupted benefits slowly, but surely after that it creeps back up. And then we see about 30 to 40% of people coming back for a single ketamine session and maybe a single integration session. And that seems to sustain the benefits um much longer term um and uh and so you know do do we offer lifelong kind of like getting to the root cause we do the best we can within a, a given scope of of work and i think we do a lot more than other people but that's exactly why the trip app is there as well so as you said it's a daily practice and and most people, certainly I can't, but I suspect most people can't do this on a daily basis, show up to a clinic and work with a therapist. It'd be too expensive and too time consuming, but with the right tools and the right support and importantly, community to remind you that this is something to be doing daily or regularly and inspiring you either through conversations or new content or new music, uh, I think is an important piece of it. And so you'll see going forward, our trip app is going to become a much more central theme in our offerings because we realize you know it's about again uh, ripping off jamie wheel from uh, capture the rapture it, it's about uh, he calls it um uh ecstasis catharsis catharsis and communitas which is inspiration healing and community and so you know we've kind of got all of that now within field trip we've got the healing that comes from our field trip health centers or the at-home offerings we've got the inspiration that comes from all the content and the conversation and the awareness and then we've got the community built right into the app now as well um, so people can connect and, and stay in the process for as long as possible beautiful that's no this is these are very important conversations that have come up so much around community and connection and you know it's it's not just the magic pill. It's like the daily, the daily practice, the daily connection, the, the discussions, you know, having people to connect with to know you're actually not alone. Um, especially, I mean, I personally believe a, a root cause of a lot of this low lying depression, anxiety that so many people in our society feel is this disconnection. You know, it's like disconnection from one another, disconnection from self, from, from the earth. You know, it's like we could go on and on about this. But, you know, you mentioned one word that, that sparked a conversation that I want to ask about is accessibility. Um, I've asked a lot of people about this on the podcast for, you know, the last year and a half, and it's come up a lot. As this psychedelic space or ecosystem grows, um, you know, personally, I find it interesting that it is still considered very expensive um, in the grand scheme of you know, just buy some mushrooms from someone, maybe for like 20 bucks, then you take them on your own. There's that. And then there's going to psychedelic assisted therapy where it's maybe sometimes in the thousands after a while or, you know, hundreds. Um, you know, how do we deal with the future of accessibility? Because um, right now, like I have friends and clients that are psychedelic assisted therapists that are booked solid. They're not even taking new clients. So there's accessibility where it's like the supply and demand. Um, you know, disparity there, which is the demand is very high. The supply of actual licensed therapists and actual, you know, places to do this is, is lower. And I know it's growing. And then there's accessibility where certain, um, you know, people in certain income brackets actually can't afford to get this care. How do you guys address both of these issues? Um, or, or, you know, even like our psychedelic space, like how is this going to be addressed over the next few years as this grows? 
Yeah, it's a it's a fair question, and and there's no perfect answer. Um, you know, I, I think in the short term, it's going to remain primarily inaccessible, uh, and that's unfortunate. But I think that's the the truth of it. You know, we're certainly we're certainly trying to do what we can in terms of innovating on business models to increase accessibility, lower cost, and and, and make it more and enable people to make more informed, educated decisions uh, around this kind of stuff. Um, but it's an imperfect solution. I think, you know, as you were speaking, I, I kind of got a vision of how this could play out, but it, it really requires like a kind of a kind of seismic shift in a little bit of our society because in the short term, it's going to continue status quo. You know, all the companies providing this are going to try and make it more accessible. But, you know, the, the gating item is that the cost associated with it is that you have a lot of highly trained people who want to get paid for their time being involved in the process, right? That's what makes it expensive. You know, if you look at the MAPS protocol with 84 hours of therapist time, you know, therapists need to make a living and have to pay back their student debts and all that kind of stuff too. So they have to charge a a living rate. And and so you multiply that living rate by 84 hours. It can't not be expensive, right? Um, And so I think what we see is you remain relatively inaccessible for the short term, I think we're going to start to see with MDMA assisted therapy and psilocybin assisted therapy, there'll be more insurance coverage, which will enable greater access because the econometrics around these therapies are, are pretty incredible. So I think you'll see a lot of a lot of insurance companies get on board, which will be a step in the right direction. But I think the only way we really get to um, really broad access is to have people feel comfortable with this. Like right now, it it really is held in the paradigm of you need a doctor and a trained psychotherapist and and like that's the only way to quote unquote safely do this um but if we get to a point where you know it's just infused into our culture and and so you have elders within the community who have a lot of experience and therefore are able uh in a non-professional context but within the context of community or or a religious organization take people through these experiences as part of that spiritual growth then I could see a place where there is robust, broad-based access. You know, thinking about the traditional uh, indigenous cultures that worked with these many of these molecules and compounds earlier, it was a cultural thing. And, and so I think we need to get to a place where this is a cultural thing, and, and there's a lot of people who not necessarily are trained, but through apprenticeship and experience are qualified to oversee these experiences, which may not be right for every single person especially like the most extreme mental health conditions but for the average person dealing with the normal everyday anxieties and challenges of life may be extremely well equipped to to oversee those experiences and and i think we get there and and that's why i I, i'm personally passionate about the whole cultural conversation like it really is much more of a medical much more than a medical or therapy conversation it really is a cultural conversation i think we need to be having here yeah. And I agree. I mean, it's, it's a double edged sword. I, I mean, I loved asking these devil av- devil's advocate questions about accessibility and affordability. I mean, but there's also reality. It's, it's the whole system that we're in is um it, it's, it's pretty much broken, right? It's like, I mean, even people can't afford, there's, there's many people out there who can't afford regular therapists, forget the psychedelics, you know, 150 to $200 a session is not for everybody. Um, so I do believe it is something with the whole system. And I know people want the easy answer and there's just no answer. But I think having these conversations is good to explore, you know, what could it look like? Or maybe there is a separate, I keep, I keep praying for a whole separate insurance model, um, which I know, I know it's coming at some level, it has to be, but, um, where there's, you know, it's like not the traditional insurance companies, you know, I don't know how Canada is a different story, but here in America, we all know it's definitely a broken system that doesn't really serve at, at the best that I think it could be. Um, so maybe we'll see a whole entire new models for supporting psychedelic therapy or, you know, psychedelics in general. Um, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned, and this is something that, of course, comes up a lot with the work I do. You know, I have clients who are, um, trained, but maybe not trained at MAPS or trained at one of the, the you know, three or four couple schools that teach psychedelic assisted therapy, but they're trained underground or they've been working with a facilitator in uh, Mexico for the last six years. Or um, I had a client that actually trained under a psychedelic assisted or, you know, a psychedelic therapist, um, but kind of 
underground and did other therapy trainings, you know, um, internal family systems, somatic therapy, all these really, you know, amazing cutting edge therapies that are, have, have been found to work alongside the psychedelics, you know, especially somatic therapies, but you know, she's not licensed. So it's kind of this whole underground thing, um, which, you know, I'm curious, you know, there's the underground aspect. And then there's also people that are doing, let's say, integration coaching, um, where they're not giving psychedelics, but there's someone who can help, let's say someone who goes through the field trip protocol, but wants to really dive deeper into this process work. You know, it's not just one or two sessions, but maybe it's six months or maybe it's a year even. Um, do you think there's room for both of these in the in this, in this space or are the, you know, is it going to remain that there's always going to be this underground, um, you know, is, is this like the solution accessibility? And then also, do you feel like there's space for integration therapists in, you know, the field trips of the world, like in this, you know, legal model? Um, like have you guys hired or brought on integration coaches as part of your business or not because there's a therapist? Uh, I mean, we set up a program called the and beyond program, which was designed to essentially hand off the people who come through the protocols to someone, a therapist that we felt was well equipped to kind of do ongoing care. It never really took off. Um, you know, it probably wasn't resourced and we had enough other focuses just focusing on the immediate um, uh, operations of the business. But I think it's going to be coming back to life and, and, maybe in a different format, probably soon enough. Um, uh, so yes, I, I mean, I think that's important saying, so, you know, I, I mean, if we, if we zoom out like a thousand miles, the reason we all need therapists is not because, you know, uh, therapy, the world needs more therapists. It's because like, there's probably something functionally wrong with a lot of the ways that we're interacting. Right. And then, so that's why it goes back to a cultural conversation. Um, but do I think there's space and scope? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I absolutely think that there's there's different levels. Here's here's like the honest conversation I think that needs to be had is that if it's not a regular, even in a re a regulated environment helps to minimize risk. It doesn't eliminate risk. A non-regulated envi regulated environment just means that there's more risk that you're going to end up with someone who doesn't know how to handle a challenging situation or says the wrong thing um, because they're not equipped. You know, if we're prepared as a society to say like, yeah, that's okay. It's like there are car accidents. There are things that go wrong all the time. Instead of trying to eliminate the risk. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of directly proportional. The more you try and squeeze out risk, the more you increase cost and you decrease accessibility. Like it, they're one-to-one -one basically um, uh, uh, causation. So if, if we're all prepared to say like, listen, there's going to be some risk and there's going to be some bad experiences. And, and you know, I got in a Twitter conversation about the, there was a, a, a maps um, uh, session in part of their clinical trial a few years ago in Canada where the therapist asked it, acted out of turn. Uh, and I think, you know, the mature conversation is that's a tragedy and it shouldn't happen and we still shouldn't continue progress. And, and it's just like, we just have to accept that this is going to happen and it, it sucks, but it's a part of finding the balance. You know, if there's a perfect answer, there wouldn't be a need for a balance. There would just be a perfect answer. Um, and so, yeah. So I, I do think there's space and I think there's going to be needed, particularly as the emphasis, at least right now, has been trying to squeeze it into a very medical and therefore very expensive risk mitigated model. You know, um, there's going to be people going underground because they can't access it or it's too expensive or anything along those lines. And, you know, again, I think my view is like, I think that's great. You know, 90% of the time, 95, 99% of the time, it'll be go swimmingly. It'll be that like one or 2% of the time that it doesn't go swimmingly. But that one or two percent of the time it doesn't go swimmingly also exists in the medical model as well. So that's the, kind of the real conversation of of just how much where, where how much we're moving the needle up or to the side uh, that needs to be, you know, truthfully constantly reevaluated. One of the things I take from my legal my legal experiences is that all policies, all laws, all rules and regulations create follow on effects. And then people try and get around them or you don't anticipate one of the consequences of what people have to react. And so you're constantly chasing, you know, instead of creating some artificial framework from day one, just constantly be evolving the conversation, you know, don't make it so, you know, lockstep 
keep it fluid. And uh, these are basic design principles too, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, but that's not how regulators think. That's not how most doctors think. And, and so again, it becomes a conversation about how we get there. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, the reality is we're all human. We're all learning. We're figuring this out. This is a totally new, you know, space that we're in here. I mean, yes, psychedelics have been used for thousands of years, but to approach it this way at these times that we're in, in this world that we're in now, um, the reality is, yeah, like the, because I actually just had a conversation with someone about the MAPS incident. And I was like, well, look, like we can shut down the entire industry and that wouldn't really serve anybody. But, you know, the, the I agree the mature way is like, how can we actually have a learning experience from this so we can maybe, um, you know, change something in our protocol or create a code of conduct, co- code of conduct or, um, you know, at least have conversations around how do we approach this better? Or how do we hold people accountable? Because this does happen. The reality is it's been happening for thousands of years as well. You know, it's it's not new and it's not new to just the psychedelic space. I mean, we all know there's horror stories everywhere. Um, and it's also called being human, right? Um, so let me ask, I'm curious, you know, you you mentioned you have a psilocybin assisted therapy out in the Netherlands. I'm curious what the future is for field trip with psilocybin here in, um, you know, Oregon or in the U S like, do you have plans for expansion? And then you also mentioned another compound of, uh, something you're working on in your pharmaceutical division, or, um, I don't know if that's the right word, but what is that all about? Are you guys working on like coming up with a new formula that will make everybody have amazing, happy relationships and there's no more divorce on the, the planet, <laughs> you know, things like that. <laughs> What's your future I, I, I there? Wish, yeah, I wish there was that profound. So, I mean, from our perspective, right now we're focused on our, our twelve locations uh, and, and continuing to bring them up the curve. And then, you know, um, as they get up the curve, and, and just given the capital markets environment, really focused on on being as cash flow positive and profitable as quickly as possible, and not relying on public markets to to fund expansion, which is what we had been relying up on. On to this point. Um, and then, yeah, we'll continue to expand. We're going to continue to build our community, add new content, new features. I mean, honestly, the, the content on the trip app is absolutely fantastic. I know I'm not, I'm not objective here, but some of the music is spectacular and some of the artists we're speaking to now are just mind blowing. Um, so we're going to continue to focus on, on evolving that. And then again, we'll be strategic and opportunistic if California goes ahead and legalizes in midterm election this year, then of course we're going to reevaluate and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that that's kind of where we're looking, but we're going to be, plat, you know, molecule agnostic in our clinics. We'll work with everything. I really look forward to the day that we can get past this artificial notion of uh, MDMA assisted therapy being approved for PTSD. It's like, there's, there's going to be trauma in every case of depression and there's going to be depression in every case of PTSD and, and, and trying to rely on the DSM five as a, as a guiding principle, I think it's just foolhardy, but, um, you know, I look forward to that. And, and one of the things that's nice is that with the psychiatrist and the team that we have at field trip, and because we are as far as, as I'm aware, the largest provider of psychedelic assisted therapies in the world, we can help inform the people at the front line, you know, doing this work so they can be a little bit more responsive to certain situations and, and not necessarily be informed by rigid protocols. That's, that's my hope at least. Um, in terms of the other molecule, four uh, HODIPT, uh, it was it was it was synthesized by Alexander Shulgin, um, uh, and when we were looking at opportunities within the drug development space, we looked at psilocybin and we thought psilocybin is an incredibly potent, powerful molecule for a number of reasons and incredibly safe, and so it's a really attractive uh, medicine, you know, in, in a more conventional FDA sense, it's, it's very attractive that from that perspective, the biggest challenge with it, as well as MDMA, uh, and LSD and, and many of the molecules is that they tend to be very long experiences and talking about the cost of professional support during these experiences, you can see how it becomes expensive and more clinically difficult to administer. Um, and so we said, well, can we solve for the length, um, without changing the experience? Cause we knew people were working on DMT and 5-MeO DMT from a medical perspective. And our view was like, that's probably too much of a liftoff for initiates. You know, it's, it's not going to be something that you want to start with. Uh, and, and as we looked further into 4-HODIPT, you know, the way Shulgin described it, he said, um, it's very similar to psilocybin, very fast onset, very gentle, 
but the duration is about two hours in a, instead of four to six. And so in our research that we've done since focusing on 4-HO DIPT and, and, and moving forward with FT-104 is we found subjectively, it's very similar to psilocybin. Objectively, as in terms of what's happening in the receptors in the brain, it's almost identical to psilocybin, but it has that shorter duration of experience. The one problem with 4-HO DIPT is it's not very soluble and it's not very stable as a molecule. So as a medicine, it's not ideal. And that's why we turned it into a prodrug, just as psilocybin is actually a prodrug for psilocin. F- FT-104 is a prodrug for 4-HO DIPT. It's more stable, uh, will provide for a more consistent duration of experience. And so we think it really addresses, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of the Goldilocks of not too short because there's a belief that if it's too short, it's not going to be very therapeutic, not too long because of the attendant consequences. It kind of sits right in the middle. It's an experience that most people will not find overwhelming. And it seems at least in terms of a neurobiological perspective to have all the characteristics of psilocybin. So it seems like it really crosses three key considerations in terms of what would make a great medicine. Wow, that's incredible. Um, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm friends with a very big healthcare entrepreneur who you might even know. And many, many, many years ago, we were in London together and we both took 2CB for the first time. And our experience was like, wow, why is this not legal? It is like, you know, it was beautiful. It wasn't too long. It wasn't hard. And you actually need very little. You know, it's like a research chem, like one of his, you know, Shulgin's, um, chemicals. And of course, it's a party drug out in, you know, mostly in Europe. But it is interesting that you're exploring this realm um, because I've I've tried a couple of these other what I I always refer to as like these random chemicals. um, And I've had a couple negative experiences and then some positive ones, you know, and and they are all slightly different. Um, So it is interesting to hear that that you guys and I'm sure others out there are working on experimenting with um, the future of what we could do and what's possible with these other compounds. Um, You know, I interviewed someone a few years ago who's working on some similar forms, similar compound to MDMA that's, you know, like, I I don't really remember. It was the intention was about, you know, relationships, Um, you know, like kind of how MDMA could be used. And yeah, like exactly MDMA or or any of these substances, really, um, there's much more than just the PTSD, anxiety, depression, or or addiction recovery. Um, You know, what about the everyday person that's struggling to save their marriage or get by in life or um, deal with grief, you know, or or death? You know, that's another thing. When I interviewed Paul Stamets, the end of life therapy, I, you know, I'm curious around that. I mean, that's probably a big one, but do you guys have anything in the plan to go into that realm in the future? Like specific, you know, psychedelic assisted therapy for people experiencing end of life, you know, or terminal illnesses or end of life grief for the family? You know, has that been discussed by you guys? Is that in the business plan? Well, we've treated, um, we, we did submit a section 56 application in Canada, uh, for, uh, Corporal Scott Atkinson. That was an end of life distress, but we have supported other situations. It's a little bit more challenging for our business model because people who are at end of life, you know, tend to be in some sort of palliative care. So getting to our clinic where we actually do the work is, is more challenging. Um, but it's definitely not outside of the realm of possibility. Um, you know, we're just it, one step at a time. And, and while I think there's an incredible impact to be had right there and, you know, I have, I've had great conversations with Thomas Hartle, who was the first person to get a section 56 in Canada, you know, um, for his end of life distress. He's not, you know, he's got stage four cancer, but he's still mobile. He still travels. And, and so he was in a little bit of a different situation, but, um, that's all to say, I would love to, it's not on the immediate horizon, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be on the horizon at some point. Yeah. Well, and then a um, couple, couple, couple more quick questions. Um, so I was talking to Ronan that I'm like, I invested, I invested into some psychedelic companies because of course I believe in this space and, you know, Hey, it's kind of like gambling anyways, like investing into any company. Um, my stockbroker had no idea what I was even talking about. <laughs> I made him, I made him read up on it. I'm like, psychedelics are the next big thing. But of course, you know, there's been challenges and not just with field trip, but you know, there's challenges with all companies. And of course the whole markets, that's a whole nother story. But what are the biggest challenges that these psychedelic companies that are publicly traded, um, are facing right now and into the future, you know, and then also 
where is where is this whole um, we we don't use the word industry space? Where do you think it's all going? You know, the next few years. Yeah, I mean, the biggest challenges for all of the companies in the space right now is it's capital intensive to to scale. Um, you know, we're building a whole new infrastructure uh, to to support this. And when it comes to any drug development, which is where most of the capital has flowed to, it's a very long, long time to get to a product or get to market and it's expensive. And so in a capital markets environment where something like 25% of biotech companies are trading below cash value, which means they have more money in the bank than the world is valuing the entire company at, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, the biggest risk is just access to capital and surviving long enough to you know hit the next milestone or inflection point in their value creation efforts. Uh, that's the biggest risk. Um, you know, I, I had an insight recently that the capital markets, I mean, all capital markets are depressed and all biotech and pharma stocks are depressed uh, and all psychedelic stocks are depressed a little bit worse than those other two categories. And, and, you know, I, I had this insight recently that the markets are telling us that they don't believe that the current paradigm for uh, psychedelic medicine, and I'll use that word consciously, um, is is sufficiently de-risked to warrant the valuations that were involved with it. That you know, psilocybin may get approved, and and that's great, but just because you have an approved drug doesn't mean that you'll be successful in commercializing it, right? Because you need the infrastructure, you need the sales team, you need blah 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 blah. It's it's hard to make a drug successful, even if you get FDA approval. And I realized that in many ways we should listen to that, right? There's no doubt that psychedelics are huge, that the, someone described it as the worst kept secret in corporate America, right? And and so many people are doing it and so many more people are doing it. And I was in Davos, um, <laughs> the Tabula Rasa folks and, and the Psychedelic House of Medicine. And so many people from around the world are interested in psychedelics and, and using them for any number of purposes. It's like psychedelics are here, you know, barring some sort of return to Nixon era administration, which I don't foresee happening, you know, they're not going away and they're just going to get bigger and more relevant. And, and so I realized that the opportunity and what the markets are telling us is that we need to focus on the culture, you know, supporting all of the psychedelics that are already happening. And then that's part of the shift you're going to start seeing in, in field trip, which is like our, our app, you know, we really want it to become you know, the de facto platform for where you go to discover new content or new music or new meditations to support psychedelic experiences because all of those underground people are just going to keep doing it, but how do they do it in a way that they get more out of it and it's more interesting, you know? Um, and so I think that's the real opportunity. So the, 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 the growth of the psychedelic space is unquestioned. Uh, the, the bigger question is, is this medical first FDA approach model sustainable i think it is long term but um you know the markets clearly have had jitters and and we just kind of need to get through some i think pivotal moments we'll see hopefully later this year maps complete and have the first readout for their the second arm of their fda trial and i think you'll see life come back into the market when that happens if not beforehand um and then you'll see other clinical trials and like i said you'll probably see at least one or two states maybe washington maybe california um create legal markets similar to Oregon. So there's, there's lots of blue sky there's lots of big drivers coming. Um, it's just, uh, it's just, you know, there needs to be a, a real evaluation of whether the medical model only the medical model is the only way forward or whether there's a more robust way forward. And I think the answer is both. And, and so we're really kind of leaning into the path that people aren't exploring right now or will be you know, going forward with field trip. Beautiful. No, this, uh, I have hope, you know, I, I do agree with the, there needs to be major shifts. There's also so much to, um, you know, talk about in the culture and the support and the integration and the experience. And, you know, who knows what will happen. Maybe, um, I, I keep hoping that there's someone that comes in and just disrupts the entire healthcare industry, um, because it is like a systematic problem, um, that is affecting this, but the demand is there, you know, I, more and more people every day, it's incredible. The amount of people that are working with psychedelics are interested. You know, I don't, in my world, you know, my reality, it's like, ah, there is no stigma anymore. Of course, that's probably not true. 
to a point, but there's so much growing interest and these conversations are so important. So I'm so glad you've come here and talked to everybody about this. It's been really helpful to understand where you're going, what's happening with Field Trip, um, where you came from. You know, last question on a personal note, what are you up to? Uh, you know, where can people find you? Do you have anything you're doing on a personal level or is everything just Field Trip? Um, you know, anything you want to shout out to the audience before we head out? Sure. Quickly on the notion of stigma, I had an appointment with a neurologist yesterday uh, and he asked me what I did. So I told him and he's <laughs> like, be careful of psilocybin. That stuff will fry your brain. And I'm like, um, okay. Psilocybin? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, his point he clarified is that like when you're dealing with any street drug in particular, you know, you don't know what's in it and, and therefore it's potentially risky. But anyway, it just is an indication oh of stigma. Um, so, so what am I doing? Uh, obviously field trip right now we're spinning out, we're separating the drug development business from the clinics business. So the drug development will stay on the NASDAQ and rebrand as reunion neuroscience. And then field trip, the clinics business is going to list on the Toronto venture stock exchange, um, which is exciting. And that's my immediate focus, but in parallel, uh, shortly, I think next month, um, uh, I have a book called The Trip Journal that I co-authored with um, Corey Harrison, one of our uh, early employees here at Field Trip, which is really a very simple guide to recording the insights from your trip. Uh, it's kind of like the analog version of the Trip app. Um, so that's being published by Libra, uh, Libra Pu Publishing. Uh, we hope to have the documentary Ordinary Trip um, released sometime in October. Uh, and then early next year, Dr. Mike Dow, who's one of our therapists, uh, and I have a book called The Ketamine Breakthrough coming out, which is, you know, a really, uh, I think, really helpful overview of ketamine, ketamine-assisted therapy and best practices associated with it. Uh, so both therapist or clinician as well as patient um, can have a, a really good understanding before they go into it uh, of what that looks like. So those are some of the other projects on the go, and I'm sure more will percolate, percolate up soon, but I think that's enough for now. And, and two kids and a puppy and you know all that thing about life too. So. Aw, sweet. sweet. Well, exciting times and lots of books and a journal, everything. And I can't wait for this documentary. You'll have to you know let me know so I can share it around with the audience. People would probably love to – to watch it. But Ronan, thank you so much for your time. This has been super helpful and informative. And, you know, thank you for your work. Um, you know, I know it's not easy in your position doing what you're doing, but keep at it. You know, this is important. There's a lot of people really being served in in this uh, interesting times that we're living in. And to me, that's always number one is really like, how do we serve? How do we make the world a better place? So just know there's many people that are appreciative of your work. So Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come on. I'm glad we were able to reconnect after so many, what seems like eons ago. Um, and, and thank you for continuing to advance the dialogue. I think that's the most important thing. The most people we can speak to, the most people we can get to stop and say, hmm, maybe I should learn more. Uh, it, it's a win. And so I take every opportunity I can to have these conversations. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're feeling inspired, I'd appreciate it if you showed your love with a review. And check out my YouTube channel where you can find the video version of this podcast. You can also head to BethAWeinstein.com to learn more about me and grab my free business growth trainings. Remember, you carry your own unique medicine and your medicine is what we need for these times.